Hello and welcome to the Orthodox Oasis. My name is Drew over here, Rene Misson. What you're about to watch is a VOD of the Orthodox Oasis over on Twitch. So feel free to join us live as we play games, hang out, and chat about Orthodox stuff. Otherwise, enjoy this VOD and we'll see you soon. Have a great day. Does he never go back to this guy? What? What? He never made a part three. Well, we'll have to move on then, I guess. Uh, let's see here. Another outlandish figure in history. The strange career of the Bulgarian monk. Dun, dun, dun. Hi, this is Bill Marianis, host of... Hi, this is Faith Radio Global. This is Ancient Faith Radio, and we're oh, listener supported. Uh, Have you done your these part? These are good. Go to ancientfaith.com and click on Donate Online and give a gift today. The Orthodox Church is the historical church, the church of holy tradition. And those who count themselves as Orthodox Christians share a uniquely historical consciousness, understanding that the saints, priests, and Orthodox laymen of the past play a crucial part in their journeys toward salvation. However, there is one area of Orthodox history that very few of us know anything about, the story of Orthodoxy in the Americas. Ancient Faith Radio is thus happy to present American Orthodox History with Matthew Namey. Matthew is a writer and lecturer specializing in early American Orthodoxy and the Associate Director of the Society for Orthodox Christian History in the Americas. His appearance, dressed in a coarse black cassock, red Turkish fez with tassel and shoes without stockings, long hair and oriental appearance, caused him to be much remarked on the streets. He says he came from China to San Francisco and has traveled through the South preaching, where he was often taken for a Ku Klux, though he was never so much annoyed in any part of the world as by the ill-mannered boys in Baltimore who followed him on the street calling him Dom Pedro. Today, oh, like look at this the place. The man in the history of orthodoxy in America. His name is Father A.N. Expiridon, better known as the Bulgarian Monk. And his story will probably sound like fiction, but it's all true. And that description that you just heard came from an article in the Baltimore Sun in 1876. Father Expiridon had been in America for over a year at that point. Actually, let's start at the beginning. In April of 1875, almost a full decade after the end of the Civil War, a strange man appeared in the American South. He claimed to be a Bulgarian monk from Jerusalem, and he was touring the United States giving lectures. He had previously been a missionary to China, so he said, and had then traveled across the Pacific Ocean to San Francisco. He spoke in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where one newspaper commented, there is undoubtedly room for another church in the South, and the Greeks might as well occupy it. Two weeks later, he was in Georgia, where he told an audience that he had met a couple of old Confederate generals in Egypt, where they were serving under the Egyptian Khedive. The next year, also in Georgia, Father Expiridon lectured about the Holy Land. His appearance created quite a sensation in Covington, wrote a reporter. Some Negroes took him for King Rex and thought he had come to reestablish slavery. Others took him for a fool killer. He occasionally quoted Mark Twain, and it is the opinion of your reporter that it is from this history that he obtained most of his information. Now, the writer here is referring to Mark Twain's book, Innocence Abroad, in which Twain talks about his visit to the Holy Land. It's actually a really entertaining book. But it had come out a few years before, and, and years later, after this, this uh, report in the newspaper that I just read, 
Father Experidon told people that he was like Mark Twain and innocent abroad. And later still, he began to claim that he had actually been Twain's personal tour guide in Jerusalem. So he's, he goes from likening himself to Twain, quoting Twain, equating himself with Twain, to eventually saying, I knew Mark Twain and was his tour guide. Now, Mark Twain wasn't the only famous person that Father Experidon claimed to have known. He told people that he had traveled through Utah and met Brigham Young, the Mormon leader. When they were introduced, Brigham Young reportedly said, What kind of engine are you? Father Experidon then attempted to convert Brigham to orthodoxy and convince him to give up polygamy, but Brigham Young was not interested. On his travels, which took him all over the United States, Father Experidon was viewed as a sensational, almost a comical figure. Not everyone liked him. One reporter mocked him in this way. He said, You have seen and heard the musical talent of Italy upon your streets. You have witnessed the wonderful feats of the Japanese and the dexterity of the Chinese juggler, and have heard the red man whoop and observe his green corn dance in your operas. But when this wonderful man makes his appearance upon your streets, you need not be surprised if children have recourse to the ringing of bells, beating of brazen instruments, and that your street loafers will once begin to speak in unknown tongues as a salutatory introduction to the eighth wonder of the world. A lot of sarcasm there. Now, in West Virginia, people thought that Father Experidon was a fraud and they chased him out of the state. He later actually returned and, and had nothing but good things to say about West Virginia. In Arkansas, people were more amused than anything. Here's a story from 1882. A queer specimen of the genus Homo has been wandering aimlessly about our streets for several days past, clad in a long flowing black robe and wearing a small red skull cap, and armed with an iron rod about 30 inches long. In answer to inquiries, he says he is Christ number two come here to save, to heal and to perform miracles. One of the latter, he said, he would do yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock. At this time, he would walk across the raging Arkansas River as Christ before him had walked across the waters of Galilee. About 200 of the curious assembled to see his performance, but as might have been expected, they were sorely disappointed. The prank was wanting, and the reporter explained that Father Experidon said he was going to walk on top of the water, ended up just simply going into the water. Yet the same reporter continued, Persons who have conversed with him describe him as being quite intelligent, a fine linguist, and a great traveler, but withal somewhat cranky. Now, Father Experidon's linguistic ability was, by all accounts, prodigious. He speaks now 32 languages and dialects, reported the San Jose Daily Evening News, and if he has the same command of the others as he exhibits in English, he may be said to be fluent in all. Father Experidon claimed to have studied at Oxford University, and afterwards in Paris, St. Petersburg, Berlin, and Constantinople. He said that before becoming a monk, he had been an attorney, and by his own account, he was born sometime around 1829 or so, and began to travel and preach when he was about 30. That would put him in his middle 40s when he came to America. He somehow became acquainted with politicians from all over the United States, the man who introduced him to Brigham Young in Utah was a man named George Woods, who was the former governor of Oregon and then the governor of Utah Territory. Father Experidon took sides in various American political debates at this time. He told a Wisconsin newspaper that the people of northwestern Wisconsin were the profanest and most sacrilegious that he had yet encountered in his circuit of the world, and that Congressman Price was a good representative of them. In 1884, he supported James G. Blaine's presidential campaign, and the same year, a former Kansas governor named John St. John had run for president on the Prohibition Party ticket. The next year, in 1885, Governor St. John was speaking in favor of Prohibition in Wisconsin, and Father Experidon happened to be in the crowd. A newspaper reported, The Bulgarian monk, who had spent some time in Kansas, was invited to the platform to tell what he knew of Prohibition there. He told St. John he was a fraud, and that there was as much whiskey drank there as ever. Now, Father Experidon may have disliked Governor St. John, but he did get along with other politicians. In Texas, Governor Ross actually gave him a pet dog as a gift, and the dog would be Father Experidon's constant companion from then on. Now, here's the first mention of the dog in 1881. 
Reverend A. Enixpiridon of Bulgaria, a monk of the Greek church, has been for several days encamped in the limits of our town. He is a rare bird. He seldom indulges in the luxury of a bath. He sleeps in his small tent with his dog and his gun as his only companions, and he does his own cooking. He speaks more languages than you can number on the fingers of your two hands. Here's another fantastic description with the dog playing a prominent role. His costume is a cross between the latest style of Mother Hubbard and a baptismal robe, while his unshorn locks are partially covered by a red flannel cap. His only companion is a bay dog with a hungry look and so poor he would not cast a shadow unless he was standing sideways with a bone in his mouth. The poor dog eats and sleeps with the monk and yet seems happy. That the monk is intelligent cannot be denied, but when you think that cleanliness is next to godliness you are impressed with the thought that he is way out of rifle shot of that characteristic. Now, Father Expiridon and his dog lived a pretty rugged life. This is from the Omaha Bee in 1882. Expiridon, in accordance with the vows of his order, never sleeps in a house unless he is sick, but carries about with him a small dog tent, a kettle, and a frying pan, and is an exemplification of the motto, every man his own boarding house. Although rather thinly clad, wearing only the calico gown described, winter and summer, he sleeps on the ground, does his own cooking, and enjoys life to its fullest extent. His only companion is a fine dog. He had 17, but on account of the expense of transportation for them, he sent all but one to a friend in Boston until his return. Now speaking of transportation, Father Expiridon apparently visited every state in the Union. From local newspapers, I've been able to verify his presence in about half of the U.S. states and territories of his day, and I'm inclined to believe him when he claims to have set foot in the rest. Here's one description of his travels. The 18th of the present month, which would be August of 1885, he finished his tour of the United States, having visited every county and spoken in every state capital in the United States. He will make a pilgrimage through South America similar to the one made in this country, and from his observations will furnish material for an encyclopedia, which is being edited by the Greek church. During his 13 years' travels in this country, his expenses have been $9,863, which have been more than paid by his lecture revenues. Now, $9,863 in 1885 works out to roughly $233,000 in today's money. In other words, Father Expiridon was spending the equivalent of $18,000 per year in travel expenses. Now, and he was apparently keeping a pretty good record of it, too. The quotation I just read you mentioned an encyclopedia. It seems like Father Expiridon's purpose, at least initially, in coming to America was to write a book about the, quote, moral and social condition of the United States. Now, he never bothered to actually finish his research and complete the book. He just stayed on in America, traveling from state to state, camping, fishing, and giving speeches. People referred to him as the Bulgarian monk, and eventually he adopted this handle as his stage name. When he would go to a new town, there would be a newspaper article in the local paper announcing that the Bulgarian monk would hold forth at some opera house or street corner at a certain time. Until the mid-1880s, he talked mainly about the Holy Land and his own travels. And you have to understand, at this point in American history, much of the population, most of the population, is rural, and they are not probably going to travel very far out of their hometown during their lifetime. So somebody coming into town and preaching or, or giving a talk, that was big entertainment for them. It was one of the only ways they really got to learn about the world outside of their region or their local area. And so for somebody like Father Expiridon to come in and speak about the Holy Land and his travels around the world, that would be first-class entertainment for a lot of these small towns. Now, in 1885 or so, he shifted his emphasis. He, he, he shifted from being a lecturer and entertainer to being a preacher, and his new speeches were entitled to convert all American preachers, priests, and Christians. It's not clear what exactly he was trying to convert them to. I'm pretty sure it wasn't orthodoxy. One source actually claimed that he was preaching a new religion and calling for the abolishment of all churches. But I really don't think it was that extreme. Another description said that Father Expiridon preaches the gospel of Christ, love and charity, regardless of any sect, 
and recognizing no arbitrary teachings, no traditions, and no canonical laws. The article continues, The monk seems to delight in demonstrating from the Bible the inconsistency of the teachings of each of the Christian sects. He quotes Timothy to prove that women are forbidden to preach until after they are 60 years of age, and offers it as an indication of the absurdity of any divine inspiration being received by the Salvation Army or the Methodist female revivalist. Whereas, in the past, he had been hitting mostly the southern and eastern parts of the United States, by the late 1880s, he spent most of his time in the west, and as he would have put it, he was doing places like Idaho, Oregon, Northern California, Washington State, New Mexico, locations like that. And the people of Sonoma, California, uh, did not want him around. They were not interested in having Father Experidon preaching, and they threw wads of paper at him, and they even threw small shot, which are the little lead bullets that are used in shotguns. He had been preaching while standing on a chair, and somebody pulled the chair out from under him. Now, you would think most people would just leave at that point, but that didn't deter Father Expiridon from speaking. The next day, he preached without any trouble thanks to his double-barreled shotgun that he kept under his arm. Now, as you can see, he was getting more and more radical in his approach. One Idaho newspaper warned its readers that the Bulgarian monk was an anarchist. An Episcopal bishop in Idaho by the name of Ethelbert Talbot, who ended up in many years later becoming the head bishop of the entire Episcopal Church in America. Uh, Ethelbert Talbot happened to run into the Bulgarian monk in the late 1880s, and he said he tried to ask him about his life, but Father Expiridon repelled all attempts to draw him into conversation, nor would he accept hospitality or kindness from anyone. That's a quotation. His movements, said Talbot, were shrouded in mystery. He became less an object of amusement, uh, and, and this is me talking, not Talbot, uh, he became less an object of amusement than of mystery and even of fear. His identity as Father Expiridon gradually faded away and was replaced eventually entirely with the strange persona of the Bulgarian monk. Mothers in Idaho would warn their children, you'd better behave, don't make me get the Bulgarian monk. And then, one day, he was gone. He disappeared sometime around 1890 or 1891. Talbot, the Episcopal bishop, said that he didn't know what had happened to him, but the people of Bay Horse, Idaho, had their own theories. Reports began to circulate that the Bulgarian monk had fallen into the Salmon River and drowned. Some people even said that pieces of his clothing had been found on the riverbank. But then more stories began to come out. As the years passed, there were reports in Bay Horse of a shadowy figure in black robes pacing along the riverbank and chasing any children who came near him. He was, they said, a ghost, and he was haunting little towns in the middle of Idaho. And that is how Father A. M. Expiridon has been memorialized to this day. In the book Historic Haunted America, published in 1995, the authors have a whole chapter all about the Bulgarian monk. And other haunted house and ghost story books and websites talk about him as well. They don't know anything about his life. They don't know about his travels, his relationship to the, the church, nothing else. As far as the ghost stories are concerned, he was a weird character in Idaho, not a well-traveled monk from Jerusalem. But it's clear if you read the stories, they're talking about the same person. Now, obviously, Father Expiridon did not actually become a ghost, and he is not actually haunting places in Idaho. But it does raise the question, how did this ghost story develop? I have a theory. We know from Bishop Talbot that parents would frighten their children with stories about the Bulgarian monk. And I think it would, we can be pretty confident that he did drown or die of some similar tragic accident sometime in the early 1890s. And it would be perfectly natural for these kids who had been afraid of the Bulgarian monk to then make up campfire tales about him becoming a ghost and haunting their town. And they would probably tell their younger siblings about this, and gradually the details of Father Expiridon would fade, and the caricature of the Bulgarian monk ghost would be all that would remain. In any event, we've reached the end of the Father Expiridon story. At first glance, he seems that was like great. a historical anomaly. He has no ties to the rest of American Orthodoxy. He had no connection to the Russian mission or to the Greek parishes that were popping up at the end of his life. 
and we can't even really be sure about the details of his life, which evolved as his storytelling got more elaborate. He's really the only source for his biography, so we can't really trust him because he was such a, an outlandish figure. But there is some significance to him. As I've said in the past, for orthodoxy, America is a frontier region. And frontiers, like the Wild West, attract all sorts of characters, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, Father Expiridon was one of the ugly ones, and he proves that America really is an orthodox frontier, and he proves it in the most outlandish of ways. And I hope you've, from this, not only seen that America is a frontier, but also seen how entertaining church history can be. There are characters, maybe not quite as strange as Father Expiridon, but there are plenty of strange ones in our past. And while they may not all have lessons for us, I do think they're worth talking about. And I will look forward to speaking with you next time. Thank you. You've been listening to American Orthodox History with Matthew Namey. Matthew is a writer and lecturer specializing in early American Orthodoxy and the Associate Director of the Society for Orthodox Christian History in the Americas. For supplemental material related to this episode, please visit orthodoxhistory.org. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio on the web at ancientfaith.com. I don't know if that one quite fit, but it was interesting, I'll say that. So it's the Orthodox history, and this is just a crazy guy walking around preaching with a shotgun because that's what you do sometimes. Oh no. There we go. All right, what's next? The first two convert priests. This is about Nicholas. Bjerring and James Crystal. Hi, this is Bill Marianis, host of the live. Hi, this is John Maddox. You know, we have nearly a quarter of a million downloads of our audio files every month at Ancient Faith Radio, and we know that represents thousands of listeners. If just a small percentage of you who download our podcasts would give even $10, 15 or $20, you just can't imagine the impact that would have. If you are a regular listener to Ancient Faith Radio and have not yet supported us, please consider doing so today. So far, Final Fantasy II has been Faith. way easier than the first click one. click on Donate Online. Thank you. The Orthodox way Church is easier. the historical church, the church of holy tradition. And those who count themselves as Orthodox Christians share a uniquely historical consciousness, understanding that the saints, priests, and Orthodox laymen of the past play a crucial part in their journeys toward salvation. However, there is one area of Orthodox history that very few of us know anything about, the story of Orthodoxy in the Americas. Ancient Faith Radio is thus happy to present American Orthodox History with Matthew Namey. Matthew is a writer and lecturer specializing in early American Orthodoxy and the Associate Director of the Society for Orthodox Christian History in the Americas. Welcome back to American The Flying Orthodox Ray. Day. Today we'll be talking about the first two convert priests in American Orthodox history. Both of these men actually uh, were born in 1831. Both of them uh, converted very quickly uh, and were ordained very quickly. Uh, they were converted about the same time. Both of them were based in the New York City area, and uh, both of them ended up leaving the Orthodox Church before all, all was said and done. So we'll, well, the first one we'll talk about is the most prominent. His name was Nicholas Bjering. Uh, now, Nicholas Bjering was originally from Denmark, uh, as I said, born in 1831. Bjering. He was the son of a local city official. He was very well educated, studied philosophy and theology at the University of Breslau, and then he became a missionary to Lapland. In 1868, he immigrated to America, and he became a teacher at a Roman Catholic school in Baltimore, Maryland. He was, he was a Roman Catholic layman. He was married. I believe he and his wife already started having children. They would have more to come. In 1870, so just a couple years after Bjerring's arrival in America, in 1870, the Roman Catholic Church was about to declare papal infallibility to be a dogma of the faith. This would be done at the First Vatican Council. 
and Nicholas Bjering could not accept this. He was absolutely appalled, and he wrote a letter to Pope Pius IX, who was the Pope at the time, objecting to this doctrine. And this letter received a great deal of attention. It was published in a number of newspapers and magazines. And I'll read a few sections here because it's, it's a r really interesting document. Bjering wrote, It is impossible that the duty of being a good Christian involves the necessity to cease being a citizen, to abstain from all progress, to shut out all light, and to go back, groping in the dark, to the Middle Ages with all their concomitant evils and pernicious abuses. He continued, Holy Father, in my name and in that of many thousands of laymen who are laboring under the same impressions as myself, I protest against the doctrines which you seem determined to promulgate and which openly conflict with all divine and human laws. I protest against the fatal contest which you have originated between church and society. I protest against the sacrilegious sentence you have pronounced against all progress and against every department of science. I protest against the principle of papal infallibility, which you aim to establish as a dogma in papal contradiction with the text of the gospel and with ecclesiastical traditions. Now, having given up on Roman Catholicism, Bjering now wonders what to do next. And he said to the Pope, in the face of such a serious and irretrievable wrong, what consolation remains then for the souls of the faithful and believing? Must they, in abandoning that Church of Rome, to which their convictions urge them no longer to belong, embark with rationalism as their only companion on the troubled waters of Protestantism, at the risk of perishing among the breakers of pantheism? Bjering then answered his own question. He writes, I have found the true Catholic and apostolic church. It is the Orthodox Church of the East. That church has maintained uncontaminated the holy ark of the evangelical doctrines. And finally, Bjering said, the Orthodox Church will deign, I trust, to extend to me her maternal arms. So Bjering wrote this letter to the Pope, and then he wrote another letter, and this one was a private letter to the Holy Synod of Russia asking to join the Orthodox Church. The Holy Synod wrote back and requested that Bjering come to St. Petersburg in Russia, and uh, Bjering did so. He went to St. Petersburg and was there for not a very long time, and while there was received into the church and ordained an Orthodox priest. And he was ordained on May the 9th, 1870. He served his first liturgy in German because he didn't know Church Slavonic, and very soon after this, Again, I mean, we're, we're talking about a matter of days from his after his conversion. He was elevated to archpriest, and he was sent to New York City to found a chapel. So Bjering arrives in New York. In October of 1870, he founded Holy Trinity Chapel in New York City. And this chapel was a very modest place. It was located on the parlor floor of Bjering's home at 651 Second Avenue in New York City. And uh, the New York Times called it a tasty little Greek chapel. It didn't hold a lot of people. Uh, the iconostasis of the chapel was, was very small. It actually only had the royal doors. It didn't have deacon's doors. So uh, when Bjering would do the little and great entrances during the liturgies, he would do them just in and out, both through the royal doors. And for many years after this, there would be talk of building a real Orthodox temple in New York City, but it never happened. And uh, the Orthodox community in the city remained very small. It was maybe a hundred people. One of the odd things about Nicholas Bjering, Father Nicholas Bjering, is that he expressly discouraged conversions. In 1871, which was... You converted! ...ordination, the New York Times said, It is Father Bjering's wish that it be generally known that the Greek chapel is a private chapel of the Russian and Greek legations, and is not open for public worship. Bjering did welcome orderly and respectable ladies and gentlemen if they wished to see what the Orthodox Church looked like, but he was not interested in evangelism. Now, part of this stemmed from a view, which was held by many at the time, that the Orthodox and Anglican churches would soon unite, at which point, presumably, from the Orthodox perspective, 
the Episcopal Church in the United States would simply become the Orthodox Church in the United States. So there was really little point in converting Americans to Orthodoxy. They could just be Anglicans. One article in 1870 said, It must not be supposed that Father Bjering contemplates introducing a fresh element of discord into the religious world of America. For a long time, the union of the Greek and Episcopal churches has been advocated by many members of both, and the good father hoped that the opening of a Greek church in New York may do much towards consummating this movement. So, Bjering saw himself as a kind of a religious ambassador to America. He served the people, the staff of the Russian and Greek embassies in America, ministered to the very small Orthodox flock in New York, and native Orthodox, you know, the cradle Orthodox flock, and uh, he engaged in what today we would consider to be ecumenical relations. One of Bjering's main tasks was publishing. As I said, he couldn't read Russian or Church Slavonic, but he did translate some Orthodox texts from German into English. These were texts, most of which had been originally in Russian, then translated into German, and then Bjering translated them from the German into English. And he started a periodical, a magazine, Oriental Church Magazine, and uh, in that magazine he published translations and other articles. And the magazine's subtitle was Devoted to Religion, Science, Literature, and Art. According to Father Oliver Herbel, Bjering saw the journal's purpose as twofold. First of all, it was supposed to educate non-Orthodox people about pretty much anything and everything related to Orthodoxy. Bjering was especially interested in progress, which in his mind was Orthodoxy's engagement with society and its moral development. He also wanted to talk about traditionally Orthodox cultures, such as Russian culture. The other purpose of the magazine was ecumenical, to promote relations between the Orthodox and other Christian bodies. One of the biggest moments in the early years of Bjering's Orthodox career Monsters. was the 1871 and 72 visit of Grand Duke Alexei of Russia. Grand Duke Alexei came to America, a very famous visit. On uh, this trip, the Grand Duke was it was a huge celebrity. Wherever he went, he was received as an honored dignitary. Famous Americans were eager to meet him. The president at the time, Ulysses S. Grant, and most of Grant's cabinet were there to meet the Grand Duke when the Grand Duke came to Washington, D.C. Alexei went on a famous buffalo hunt with Buffalo Bill Cody. He went underneath the Niagara Falls with his entourage. He attended Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And uh, actually, while he was in New Orleans, he, he ended up meeting with the representatives from the, the Greek church in that city, which was, was very, in, you know, in its earliest years. And also in November of 1871, the Grand Duke visited Nicholas Bjering's little chapel in New York City, which of course was the only Russian Orthodox place of worship east of California at the time. There were of course numerous churches in Alaska. There was a church in San Francisco, which is where the bishop was located, and that was it. And then there was Bjering's chapel on the other coast, on the Atlantic coast. There were no other Russian churches in between San Francisco and New York, and the only other Orthodox church period was the Greek church in New Orleans. Now, the Grand Duke's visit was a very big deal, and Bjering had the chapel completely renovated for the occasion. And all of a sudden, he had to deal with this crush of visitors trying to catch a glimpse of the Grand Duke. And most of these unwanted visitors were young American girls who were just crazy about this young and exciting and handsome Russian prince. One contemporary account talked about how mad these girls were for the Grand Duke, and, and it said, the house of the priest of the Greek church has been besieged by the sex, we are told, begging the privilege of attending service in the chapel, which would not hold a tithe of them, that they might get a single glimpse of his royal highness. The visit ended up, it, it went off okay. Um, there were a lot of dignitaries in attendance. Bjering gave a, a little speech in which he said that God had granted to Russia the divine mission of uniting all Orthodox Christians. But Bjering, he got involved in the broader New York society as well. He wasn't just focused on being an Orthodox priest. He hobnobbed with a lot of people. He was an active member of the American Geographical Society, which is a very active 
organization brought in a lot of dignitaries from all over the world, really. And uh, Gehring was often in the newspapers in connection with one or another organization he was involved in. Later on, uh, a number of years later, he would join a Masonic Ew. lodge. He was very public about his political views. For a while, he was vice president of the German Republican Central Committee. And in 1892, he decided to switch close. from the Republican to the Democratic Party. And he was actually prominent enough that the story about his switching parties made it into the New York Times. Bering was a big believer in the betterment of humanity, what's been called the social gospel movement. He tried to help new immigrants and the poor. In 1881, he co-founded the Russian Benevolent Society, which helped needy Russians get money, find work, get assistance when they were sick. According to Father Oliver Herbel, who is almost certainly the world's leading expert on Nicholas Bjering. According to Father Oliver, Bjering maintained a dogmatic commitment to an understanding of Christianity that necessitated involvement in social ministry. This was the common thread in Bjering's life throughout all of his religious changes and conversions and so forth, was that this common thread of progress of the social gospel. As an Orthodox priest, Bjering had a lot of issues. In 1879, Bishop Nestor, who was based in San Francisco, the Russian bishop, he paid a visit to the New York chapel, and after that visit, he sent a report back to Russia. And the report was not good. Bishop Nestor said that Bjering was completely ignorant of Slavic and that he pronounced and spoke so badly that it was understood only because the content of the liturgy is known by everyone. Father Bjering, Bishop Nestor said, did not have the courage to read the gospel in Slavic and read it in English. But here too, the words Jesus Christ he pronounced in Slavic and not in English, and therefore it became a mixture of Slavic and English, which pronounced an unpleasant impression on the Russians and on others. Greeks and English who were present. In addition, Bishop Nestor said, Father Bjering has bad pronunciation because he is of a non-English heritage, pronouncing English with an unpleasant accent. So he couldn't speak Russian, and he didn't speak very good English. Presumably didn't speak Greek either. He wasn't really benefiting anybody with his, his linguistic abilities. Bishop Nestor went on to talk about various errors that Bjering made while he was serving the liturgy. These were what you might call rookie mistakes, mistakes that a properly trained priest with, with experience and with good training simply would not make. And Bjering had been a, a priest for nine years and he was making these mistakes. Bishop Nestor said that in spite of years of service in the church, Father Bjering showed himself completely inexperienced. Bjering also didn't know that many services. He, he knew how to serve the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, he, he knew how to serve Great Vespers, but uh, on Great and Holy Friday, for instance, which is the one day when you're not allowed to serve the Divine Liturgy, Bjering would still serve the liturgy because he didn't know the services of Holy Week. Bjering's own flock had grown tired of him. He couldn't speak their language, he didn't know the services, and they asked that he be transferred somewhere else. But as Bishop Nestor said, where do you send him? I mean, in the end, Bishop Nestor suggested that perhaps Bjering could be transferred to St. Petersburg in Russia, where he could be an assistant priest at some large parish, which would sort of hide his deficiencies. A few years after this, in 1883, the Russian government, which funded Bjering's ministry, the government decided to close the New York chapel and abandon the work there. And Bjering was, was offered a very nice, comfortable teaching position back in St. Petersburg, but uh, he was very upset about all this, declined, decided instead to leave the Orthodox Church and become a Presbyterian minister. And many years later, uh, well, a number of years later, it would be reported that uh, a lot of the, a number of the holy vessels uh, from the chapel had turned up in a pawn shop somewhere. That the implication being that Bjering had, had hawked them in a pawn shop. I should say, I can't verify that, but, but that was the report at the time. So Bjarin becomes a Presbyterian, he's accepted, his, his ordination to the Orthodox priesthood is accepted as sufficient to be a Presbyterian minister, and uh, as a Presbyterian, Bjarin continued his social action work. He remained in New York, and his parish consisted of German immigrants, and I have to think that Bjarin, who of course spoke German, 
he must have been much more comfortable living among immigrant Germans than among Russians. Now, he did some relief work among immigrants who lived in New York's tenement houses, he continued to live out that social gospel. And not long after he left the Orthodox Church, Gehring actually published a book of Orthodox services in English. And uh, in the introduction, he talked about how ignorant most Russians were. He said they needed a moral influence, as he put it. And he hoped that, uh, that, that one day the Orthodox would accept the Bible as the only source of salvation. He basically is adopting the, the sola scriptura model. Later on, he would lament that the Orthodox had condemned the 17th century ecumenical patriarch Cyril Lucaris, who was believed to have had a Calvinist theology. Viering thought that it was a tragedy that this, as he put it, this tendency to Protestantism had been conquered. And he said that together with this tendency to Protestantism being conquered, the better scientific and literary life, which Cyril had begun, has ceased to exist. So orthodoxy, in Viering's mind, in condemning Protestant theology and not adhering to the doctrine of sola scriptura, was essentially cutting itself off from life. This is not a whole lot different than his view back in 1870 towards Rome when Rome had adopted uh, the dogma of papal infallibility. Now, oddly enough, on that subject, at the very end of Viering's life, he made yet another change in his religious affiliation, and this time he converted from Presbyterianism back to the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, as a married man, he couldn't be a Roman Catholic priest, so he was received as a layman, and ironically, he ended up arguing for exactly that thing which he had once argued against, the infallibility of the Pope. He wrote, The infallibility of the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, has become dear to me in all its depth, in its whole significance, and in its absolute necessity. He went on to say that the Roman Catholic Church is the, quote, the living current through which God's grace flows into human life, uh -oh. end quote. At this point, oh, when no. became Roman Catholic again, it was 1899, so he was in his late 60s, pushing 70 years old. And this would be his last conversion. He died on September 10th, 1900, aged about 69. Now, as, as Father Oliver Herbal writes, Throughout his journey from Roman Catholicism to Orthodoxy to Presbyterianism and to Roman Catholicism again, Viering held firmly to the conviction, however imperfectly discerned, that where the one holy Catholic and apostolic church exists, there the advancement of humanity and social ministries exist, end quote. Unfortunately, this view may have influenced Viering to jump ship every time he was disappointed with his current church. Now, looking back at his Orthodox career, some people have tried to overlook Viering's apostasy, just sort of turn a blind eye to it, and view him instead as someone almost like a Saint Innocent, this sort of champion of American Orthodoxy. But in reality, Viering was a tragic and conflicted man, a religious chameleon, if you will, who unfortunately was received and ordained into the Orthodox Church without the necessary preparation. But he wasn't alone. Originally, when I was preparing for this podcast, I was going to talk just about Viering. He's a big enough subject. But then I realized that if I was going to talk about Viering, I, I really should also talk about his exact contemporary, the Reverend James Cristal. It was James Cristal, in fact, who was the first convert priest in American Orthodox history. And yet, James Cristal has been completely forgotten, even more than Vieri. And as we'll see in a moment, there's a good reason for that. James Cristal, like Vieri, was born in 1831. In his case, he was born in America, and he was ordained an Episcopal deacon in 1859, when he was 28 years old, roughly. And uh, shortly thereafter, he was made a priest. In 1861, he published a book called A History of the Modes of Christian Baptism. And in the preface to this book, Cristal himself described it as an apology for the belief of the early church that Christ enjoined triune immersion. Cristal's argument was that sprinkling, which was, of course, the form of baptism practiced 
by both Roman Catholics and Anglicans, but sprinkling was insufficient and contrary to Christ's teaching. And he did a lot of research and concluded that the Orthodox Church had alone preserved the correct practice. So naturally, Christall wanted to get one of these authentic baptisms for himself. At the end of 1868, he traveled to Greece, where he sought out Archbishop Alexander of Syra. Archbishop Alexander was actually already a, a pretty well-known figure among Anglicans. He had visited England, he had a very good relationship with the Church of England, and Archbishop Alexander examined Christall, and he was very impressed with Christall's his knowledge, his learning, his sincerity. Christall clearly knew his stuff. And uh, a local Greek newspaper at the time commented, he has acquired such accuracy concerning the theoretical parts of theology as few of the clergy and theologians among us possess. Now, satisfied with Christall's orthodoxy, the archbishop baptized him on the eve of Theophany, just after Vespers, and this would have been 1869. Christall, being uh, an unmarried man, had to obtain permission from the Holy Synod of Greece to be ordained. This was apparently the policy. And the Holy Synod gave this permission, and within a few months, Christall was ordained, and then he was elevated to the, the Archimandry. And the English Orthodox journal Orthodox Catholic Review reported that Christall had studied the Orthodox faith for six years and was fully convinced that it was the only true Catholic religion. The neophyte recited the creed in both Greek and English, and he intends on entering the ministry of the church and will in due time become bishop in Alaska, lately ceded by Russia to the United States. He is anxious to become a lawful medium between the reunionist party of the Anglo-American church, the Episcopal church, and the Orthodox church, and the Greek ecclesiastical authorities hailed his scheme. He is now busy in translating the necessary service books into English. The Greek newspaper, which I had quoted earlier, it said, We shall in a short time see formed there in America an Orthodox Church of many thousands, and the light of the East shining bright and clear even in that new world. And the newspaper then exclaimed, What glory then will it be for the Greek Church and for our nation? if by means of this her learned priest she should send out the first shining lamp of orthodoxy. They were very excited about Christall's conversion. Jonas King was a Protestant missionary to Greece at the time, and he was actually the one who translated that Greek newspaper article for a Protestant journal in the United States. That's how I got it. In conclusion, Jonas King commented sarcastically, it may be well, perhaps, to give publicity to this novel transaction, so that the people beyond the wide Atlantic may be prepared to see the light, which, it is supposed, will soon break in upon them from the east. No such light would come from the east, at least not as a result of Cristal's conversion. See, James Cristal had his own interpretation of Christianity. Father David Abramsov explains, The erratic Kristall soon repudiated his ties with the Orthodox Church, and upon his return to America formed his own Baptist-type sect, insofar as the Orthodox Church agreed with him, namely in baptism, Kristall wanted to be a part of it. But that fact was soon superseded by another. Just a year later, we find the following report. Mr. Kristall could not subscribe to the articles of the Seventh Synod of the Greek Church relating to the images and creature worship. In other words, James Christall could not accept the veneration of icons. He was, of course, hardly alone among Protestants. What escapes me, though, is how could he have somehow not noticed these icons covering the walls of the cathedral in which he was baptized and ordained? Did he simply not look up? I mean, he was clearly a learned man, he'd studied orthodoxy for half a dozen years. Was he simply unaware of the existence of the Seventh Ecumenical Council? Or was he unaware of Protestant objections to icons? Or did his views somehow change overnight in, in a matter of months? I don't know the answers to those questions. In any event, it took the Orthodox a little while to figure out that Cristal was no longer one of them, no longer one of us. Uh, in 1870, there were still various reports that the Russian government 
planned to assign a bishop to New York, actually, and had offered the job to Cristal. Cristal declined this offer and cited his opposition to icons, and only a few months after this, Father Nicholas Bjering, who we just spoke about, opened the doors of Holy Trinity Chapel in New York City. As for Cristal, he initially rejoined the Episcopal Church, but it wasn't long before he was on the move again. In his own words, he left the Episcopal Church, quote, on account of unchecked and unpunished idolatry and service of creatures in it, contrary to the faith of its reformers of blessed memory, end quote. He continued his opposition to icons for the rest of his life, and in an 1899 letter to the editor of the New York Times, Cristal argued against the practice of kissing the Bible. He went on to publish a series of books all about the Third Ecumenical Council, which, in his view, supported his iconoclastic position. His argument, which he made in this letter to the New York Times, was basically that since the Third Ecumenical Council condemned the division of Christ into two persons, a divine person and a human person, and thus condemned Ooh. the worship of merely Christ's humanity rather than the single divine human person of, of Christ, since it had done these things, that it implicitly forbade the veneration of any and all matter. Christal's, he, he wrote, as I said, he wrote books on the subject, and he, the series was called The Third World Council. And the second volume of this series, Christal dedicated to, quote, the Greek race, and the third he dedicated to the Russian people. And in both cases, he exhorted them to reject the Seventh Ecumenical Council and return, so he said, to true orthodoxy. Sort of calling to mind Bjering's call for the Orthodox to reject their, their wayward sort of ways and, and, and adopt a sola scriptura view. Anyway, James Cristal died in 1908 in Jersey City, New Jersey. He was 77 years old and had outlived Nicholas Bjering by about eight years. And so, what is the legacy of these two men? These, these contemporaries, both of whom converted, at least ostensibly, for doctrinal reasons, or you could even say ideological reasons. Uh, Bjering became orthodox because he just could not accept the dogma of papal infallibility. Cristal became orthodox because he wanted threefold immersion in baptism. Both men sought out the priesthood, and both were ordained very, very soon after their conversion. Cristal came through the Church of Greece. Bjering came through the Church of Russia. Both men were sent to New York. Both were supposed to represent orthodoxy in an America that, at that point, hardly knew orthodoxy. There was hardly any orthodoxy in America outside of Alaska. And both men went on to leave the Orthodox Church for greener pastures. Cristal almost immediately, Bjering after a 13-year career. And I think that, tragically, both of these men proved to be models for patterns that would reoccur in the future, even up to our present day. This would certainly be a problem in the teens and twenties of the 20th century. Rapid conversions and ordinations, without proper catechesis, training, and preparation. These things have been problems throughout American Orthodox history. And as I said, they became major issues in the teens and twenties, and they are most certainly still with us to this day. If you've been Orthodox for any length of time at all, there's a very good chance that you've known people who converted to Orthodoxy very quickly, without much preparation, sometimes not for all the right reasons, and then they burned out after a few years and left the church. And then there's a, there's a decent chance that you might also know, or at least know of, some of the all too many priests who joined the Orthodox Church. Perhaps they were Protestant clergymen, and they are quickly moved through the ranks of the priesthood, given parishes, and then something goes wrong. They either became disillusioned and left the church, or they brought with them baggage from their previous denomination that caused problems for themselves and their orthodox parishioners. I don't mean to end this podcast on a negative note, but it seems to me that one message of both Yering and Kristall's lives is that we should, and, and first and foremost, I mean the bishops, but I think this, this warning applies to all of us, we as the church should make it a priority to ensure that anyone becoming a priest, and particularly those who convert to orthodoxy and desire the priesthood immediately, that the, these people should be well prepared, that there should not be a rush to ordain men into the priesthood. 
Now, I know that there are plenty of exceptions. We've been talking recently about Father Ingram Nathaniel Irvine. We've discussed him at length. He is one exception. I mean, he was ordained very quickly and turned out to be a very solid priest. He remained Orthodox uh, for the rest of his life. And there are lots more like Bering today. And I know that we have a shortage of clergy. We always do. We probably always will. But we need to make it a priority to not repeat the mistakes of the past and to properly equip our priests for ministry in the Orthodox Church. We should remember as a warning the lives of Bering and Kristall and all those who came after them who converted had a passion for orthodoxy, or at least one or another aspect of orthodoxy, had the right intentions maybe, but were not well prepared. And we should do our best to ensure that that doesn't happen again. You've been listening to American Orthodox History with Matthew Namey. Matthew is a writer and lecturer specializing in early American Orthodoxy and the associate director of the Society for Orthodox Christian History in the Americas. For supplemental material related to this episode, please visit orthodoxhistory.org. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio on the web at ancientfaith.com. Baskinsk. That's a good one. Interesting. We already listened a little bit. There's the Russian Orthodox mission, part one, part two. Hey, thanks for watching. You can find more VODs here on YouTube, as well as other projects, including reviews of games I've played and movies I've watched. You can also stop by the channel, Orthodox Oasis, over on Twitch. Join us live, hang out, say hi, and all that good stuff. Otherwise, thanks for watching. This has been the Orthodox Oasis. My name is Jerome Hiranimus, and may the Lord bless you and keep you always. Bye.